The characteristics of life. If you remember nothing else this year in biology, this is key. You should be able to figure out if something is living or non-living by knowing the six characteristics that all living things have. Let's start by thinking about what exactly is life? Are these things living? Are these living? What about this? Or this? What exactly makes something living? We're going to use the word organic. Sometimes that means raised or grown without pesticides or chemical alterations. Sometimes that means containing carbon. But for biologists, it primarily means something that is living or once was once living. So what are the characteristics of life? All living things exhibit six characteristics in combination. You have to remember that and a living thing does not just have four out of the six or five out of the six. It has to have all six. The first characteristic of a living thing is that it is made of cells. This is an example of a typical animal cell and it has all of its organelles and other parts labeled. This is the, uh, the easiest characteristic, I guess, to determine whether something is living or not. If the item you're, that's in question does not have cells, it is not living, even if it exhibits all the other kinds of characteristics. For example, viruses. A virus can reproduce, kind of, it can get around, it can move to different parts of your body, uh, but it is not made of any cells. Therefore, a virus, even though it acts like other things, living things, is not living. As far as cells go, living things can either be unicellular, meaning they are made of only one cell, like a bacterium, or multicellular, meaning they are made of more than one cell, like a flower, or a human being, or a raccoon. So first characteristic, most important, must be made of cells. The second characteristic is organization. Those cells, or that living thing, must be organized down from the molecular level all the way up to the whole organism. The organization of a living thing contributes to its function, its job. If it's not organized properly, it cannot do its job. For example, the stomach. Your stomach that digests your food is a living thing, or it's a part of a living thing. And it's organized from the atoms that make up the stomach, the atoms combined to make, up, to make up compounds, the compounds combined to make up cell organs, the cell organs, which are inside a cell, make up cell tissues, and the cell tissues make up the organ itself. All the things that come together to form your stomach contribute their own functions to make the stomach function. Starting from the very smallest level of organization, we have the atom. Atoms combine to make molecules. Molecules combine to make organelles. An organelle and its other organelles combine to make a cell. So an organelle is smaller than a cell. Cells combine to make tissue. You've got skin tissue. You've got muscle tissue. You've got connective tissue. When you combine these tissues together, you can, get, you can make an organ like your brain or your heart or your liver or your eye. When you combine the organs together, you get an organ system like the digestive system or the nervous system or the musculoskeletal system. And you combine several organ systems together and you can get a multicellular organism like a tree or a human or a raccoon. Each level of organization exhibits emergent properties. This means that the level above can do things that the previous level cannot do. Let's look at this example. Inside your body, you have endothelial cells. These are cells, kind of generic little cells inside your body. If you combine those together, you get a sheet of endothelial cells. And if you wrap that sheet into a tube-like structure, you get a capillary. A capillary can transport blood. However, a single endothelial cell cannot do that. 
It has to be in combination with other cells in order to transport blood or to make the tube that the blood flows through. In addition, living things are organized beyond just one individual living thing. For example, you can have part of a flower. The, this organ system is part of a flower. It's physically and chemically connected to function together. That flower becomes part of the whole plant. You've got the flower, the roots, the stems, the leaves. That's called a multicellular organism, which is one living individual. If you combine a bunch of these same living individuals, you've got the same types of flower, all in the same area, that's called a population. If you take that population of flowers and you combine it with all of the other living things in that particular area, you've got a community. If you take all of the living and non-living things together, so the community, plus the soil, the rocks, the water, the air, etc., you've got the ecosystem for that area. And then if you combine all the ecosystems together, you get the biosphere. The biosphere is basically our entire planet where life is possible. The third characteristic of living things is that they use energy. The process of using energy inside a living organism is called metabolism. People take in chemical energy through the form of food and change it to heat and mechanical energy. Mechanical energy is what allows you to pick up your pencil or pick up your books or turn your head from side to side. Oops, plants take in a different form of energy, light energy, and change it into chemical energy called uh, the process of photosynthesis. And then they take it there, those sugar compounds that they just formed and they break them down again and they use those for their own mechanical energy. They cell division and growth and adaptation and moving toward the sunlight so that the flowers and leaves get the most sunlight, things like that. It's important to remember in on our planet that energy flow is connected. If you start with the sun, the sun is used, the sunlight is used by producers such as plants to extract energy from the non-living environment. That energy gets passed either out into the ecosystem or to some consumers. Those consumers obtain their energy by eating the producers. You are a consumer. The consumers then pass their energy, as do the producers, when they die. Both consumers and producers pass their energy to decomposers. These are things like bacteria and fungi that obtain their nutrients from dead organisms and organic waste. And then those, when the decomposers die, they turn back into these inorganic chemicals and enter back into the cycle. Fourth characteristic of living things is called homeostasis. This is what a living thing does to maintain a stable internal environment, keeping your temperature the same, keeping your level of hydration the same, keeping the same amount of salt in your bloodstream, same amount of liquid in your bloodstream. Homeostasis is the ability of an organism to maintain its internal environment despite conditions in the external environment. One of the easiest ones for us to think about is body temperature. If the body temperature rises because you have a fever or because it's really hot outside or because you just ran 26.2 miles, you sweat. You sweat in order to cool your internal body temperature down. If your body temperature gets too low because you're outside and it's really cold out or you got locked in a refrigerator somewhere, you shiver and you shiver to try and maintain a warmer internal body temperature. This is, this is kind of an easy example of homeostasis. Related to maintaining homeostasis is an organism's ability to respond to its environment. It can respond either through irritability, which is an immediate response to a stimulus, like this insect getting caught in a Venus flytrap. As soon as it triggers the little hair on the Venus flytrap, the flytrap closes. That's irritability. Or adaptation. Adaptation is an inherited behavior or characteristic that enables an organism to survive and reproduce. For example, camouflage. This organism is extremely well camouflaged in its surroundings, and that helps it probably both catch prey and avoid being eaten by predators. 
Over time, the adaptations of any group of organisms can be modified through a process called natural selection, which we will get to at the end of our course. The fifth characteristic of living things is growth and development. All living things undergo stages of growth and development as determined by their DNA. Growth occurs because cells divide, causing them to be more numerous, which causes the organism to get bigger. You are not the same size as when you were three years old, thankfully, because your cells divided and divided and divided, making you have more cells. Development occurs when cells take on specific jobs within the organism. This happens mostly when the embryo of the organism is forming before it's born. It means that you start out with this one generic type of cell and it could do any type of job and then as the embryo as the cells continue to divide and divide then the cells based on their location take on certain jobs the eye cells are specifically formed for seeing and the heart cells are specifically formed for pumping blood and so on our sixth and final characteristic is that all living things reproduce there's two forms of reproduction, asexual, which involves a single parent that basically just copies its insides and then divides into two cells. The offspring are ge genetically exactly the same as the parent. Or sexual reproduction, which involves two different parents, and the offspring are genetically diverse, meaning two parents combine their DNA, and the offspring that forms is not exactly like either one of the two parents. Very important point here, in order to be considered living, it is a must that an organism possesses all of the six characteristics, not just some of them. Let's review what those are again. Number one, must be made of cells. Number two, must show levels of organization. Number three, must use energy. Four, must maintain homeostasis. Five, must be able to grow and develop, and six must be able to reproduce. Let's take this computer as an example. The characteristics that a computer has are organization. The parts inside the computer are organized. Computers use energy. You have to plug them in. They have to get electricity in order to run. And lastly, a computer can maintain homeostasis. If you've ever been around an old computer you can see or you can hear when it gets too hot inside the computer a fan inside turns on and starts to blow cool air or get rid of the hot air that's in there so that the computer parts don't get too hot however is a computer actually living no it does not have cells a computer does not grow its inside parts do not develop into other things and it cannot reproduce on its own. So on your assignment, please make sure you take this short quiz, answer these four questions. What is an example of homeostasis? Why is energy required by living things? Is a computer living and explain why or why not? And now a new example is fire living, explain why or why not. Make sure you understand these six characteristics in your next assignment. Not this one, but the next one called Marty in the Car. You're going to have to read a little scenario and figure out whether something is living or non-living based on these six things. If you have any questions, make sure you send me an email.